Tonight is very special because we get to hear from one of BC's most renowned biologists, conservationists, activists on a topic that is dear to many people's hearts, the health of wild salmon, one of the keystone species of our coast that is critical to the forests, the bears, and all the ecosystems that support life in our part of the world. Now, if you're attending this event, I'm going to assume that you've been following the news on fish farms and how their proliferation is threatening the viability of wild salmon in the Pacific Northwest. And so I'm excited to have with us today a journalist who has been covering this issue and spent time in the communities impacted by these fish farms and has talked to the indigenous nations who have been leading the push to protect wild salmon. I also have a surprise for you tonight. Our friend from Massey Books, which is a beautiful bookstore in Chinatown in Vancouver, are the official booksellers for this event, and they have 20 signed copies of the book. So you can go get a signed copy with them directly. Now, if you're interested in that, stick around to the end and I'll give you more details and instructions on how to get those signed copies. So now let me introduce tonight's speakers. Alexandra, Emily, can you please join me on stage? Hello, nice to see you. So Alexandra Morton is a marine biologist and activist who has been called the Jane Goodall of Canada, thanks to her 30 year fight to save British Columbia's wild salmon. She moved to BC from California in the eighties to study the Northern resident orcas. And then the fish farms came in, which chased away the orcas. So she shifted her academic focus to research the infectious diseases and parasites that these fish farms generate and how they're affecting the wild salmon populations. Tonight she's here because she's published a wonderful book called Not On My Watch on how she spent the last 30 years pushing against fish farms and using her science and activism to change policy and save our coastal ecosystems. Now, to give you a taste of the book, we're going to share a link to a column that she wrote for the Globe and Mail this past weekend. And it took the entire page of the opinion section. So please click on it when you have a second. And to guide the conversation tonight, I'm pleased to introduce Emily Gilpin, who is a journalist and the managing editor of Indigenous News. Now, she has spent her career advocating for more equitable representation in media, anti-oppression training for journalists, accurate coverage of Indigenous peoples, cultures, and communities. In her previous role, she was a reporter for the National Observer, where she launched a series called First Nations Forward. Now, we're going to link to a very powerful investigation she did about the fight to save wild salmon, which features Alexandra. So check that one out too. And so what we're gonna do now is they're gonna talk for about 40 minutes and then we're gonna open it up to questions from the audience. So as you're listening to this conversation, if you think of a great question, please use the Q and A button there in the chat, or sorry, in the in Zoom to share it there. So that way it'll be easier for panelists to identify and find your questions and then answer them. So enough from me, uh, Emily, please take it away. Great, thank you, Jorge, and thank you to the Vancouver Public Library for inviting me to be a part of this event tonight. I was very excited. I actually haven't had the chance to talk to Alexandra since the first time I met her, which was on a fish farm in Numgis territory where she was occupying and doing research. And it was actually one of my first gigs, my very first gig with National Observer um, to go and see what was going on, why there was this group of people that were occupying this fish farm, indigenous led, um, land defense. And so, you know, I made my way out there and met this, this woman that was just so passionate about protecting wild salmon. And here we are years later, still talking about salmon. Um, and I wanted to let everyone know that I'm joining you tonight from the beautiful territories, the unceded territories of the Wissanich Nation. I myself am a Machif nomad. I'm Cree Métis, Filipina, Scottish and Irish descent. And I've been pretty nomadic for the large majority of my life, which means I've learned how to be a good visitor and respect and uphold place-based protocols. Um, so I'm trying to be a good visitor here. And part of my responsibilities, it's actually something that runs in my family is to listen to and carry stories and be a vessel for stories. So that brought me to journalism um, and it brought me here tonight. So I'm so grateful that Alexandra is here with me and before we jump right into questions, I'm wondering, Alexandra, do you mind introducing yourself for everybody? Hi, I'm Alexandra Morton. I'm very happy to be sitting in Namgis territory. And I, I came here following uh, Orca and, and, and strangely didn't really notice where I was. I was just following the whales, but uh, I know where I am now. 
and it's it's been a long fight and uh, hopefully we get into the the story enough that you understand the complexities. Before we jump into talk, I do want to talk about that whale that you followed. Um, but before we get into that, can you tell me right out the gate, not on my watch? What does that mean? It means that this industry, the salmon farming industry, was not going to come into this territory and destroy this place without me doing everything I could to stop them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And so I haven't received the hard copy of the book yet, but I did receive a PDF. And I'm not a big fan of reading on my computer or phone. You know, I, I like the hard copy. I like to smell it. I like to flip through the pages, make notes. But you had me gripped. You know, it was worth it. I was I was actually just uh -huh. visiting Cleoquit territory. I was up in Tofino. Um, I was witnessing a canoe steaming. And I had some time, so I was on the beach. It was a nice day. And there I am on my phone, just scrolling through. I was crying, Alexander was crying. And you know, I'm an empath. My heart's wide open. I love sentient beings, you know, like all my relatives. So you started the story talking about uh, Corky and Orky, is it? Yes. Two whales that you got to know and you, they were living in captivity. And at that time you were sharing that you didn't realize kind of the extent of suffering that they were under. Um, and it, it was just so timely because we're in this pandemic, right? We're, we're still in an ongoing global pandemic that we can't be desensitized to. Um, but you were alluding to, you know, how important it is for us to keep feeling, you know, for each other, for these relatives um, and to speak in some ways for them as well and, and kind of fight that fight. Have you always been like that? Have you always been drawn to animal beings, to non-human beings? And have you always been empathetic? Uh, yes, the answer to that is yes. As a, mm -hmm. as a child, my, I, I grew up on the East Coast and my passion was reptiles and amphibians. I was fascinated with snakes and frogs and um, I remember watching a, a little tadpole get its fourth leg, and I was so amazed how this little fellow knew exactly what to do with that leg. There was no questioning. And I loved that about the animal world where I was a really awkward person, but there was a certain knowing and understanding of their place in the world. So yeah, I was completely drawn to them. And by the time I became a teenager, I was absolutely dedicated to trying to learn the language in another large brain animal. And, and for that reason, picked the orca. Mm -hmm. And then you followed that pod, hey, to the West Coast. Yeah, so I started in a tank uh, watching them. Uh, and I thought, you know, everything was fine there. They had babies and the babies kept dying. Mm -hmm. And I had to realize that it wasn't, wasn't good. And I saw the grief of the mother. And you really couldn't see it as any other way mm -hmm. uh, except grief. And, and really one of the biggest regrets in my life is that I did walk away and I found her family and you know that she couldn't come with me. Mm -hmm. um, but something about youth, uh, it's, it's a series of blindnesses. <laughs> I was so focused. I didn't see the problem with the whales. I didn't understand that I could maybe have fixed that. And, but then I followed whales into First Nation territory, and I didn't even know that I was in First Nation territory. Mm -hmm. I have now apologized in every big house in this entire region for that. Mm -hmm. But um, that is the great thing about getting older is that you see more and more and how it is all connected. And, you know, in my case, my role in, in how I want to try to nurture that thing to keep growing, the, the whole connection here. Mm -hmm. I want to read a little short part from the prologue because you do kind of start from the end in some ways and, and you recognize that right off the bat in the book. Um, you say that I didn't immediately recognize the difference between the nomads of the planet, meaning people who moved generation after generation, and the people who spent thousands of years in one place. Over the years, I've encountered instances where my Indigenous companions have heard and felt things I don't. Asking them questions didn't help. I was simply not adapted to the place and did not have the internal hardware to perceive some things. And then you talk about how scientists 
because spend years, you know, measuring and doing, and there, there is a relationship there, but at the beginning, like you said, in that youth, in that blind youth, which is both a blessing and a curse in many ways, yeah. you didn't realize your place in it. So, you know, we, we still want to dig into a lot of these conversations and topics, but kind of starting from the end, what is your place now in that conversation? Oh, my place now is, is to work with these first nation governments. Some pay me, some don't. It makes a difference to me because they want life. Mm -hmm. And one of the realizations just in the last few months really is that the non-Indigenous governments were not actually built to protect things that nobody owned. Mm -hmm. They just, they're not bad or wrong, uh, but they weren't built for that. They're built to uh, take, take information from groups, interest groups, corporations, mm -hmm. uh, users. But the indigenous governments were built at a time where if the salmon went extinct, so did the village. Mm -hmm. The linkage was so much uh, tighter. And so there are mechanisms within indigenous governments and in particularly the mysterious hereditary government, which I don't even begin to understand, but mm -hmm. I can see it's built out of heads of houses that have to all discuss what happens and work it out that way with enormously powerful women influencing the discussions. Very complex, which we humans require. Mm -hmm. And so my role right now is back to the role of the biologist. Mm -hmm. And so I spend all of my time, like I'm gonna start my 22nd year of sea lice research here. Actually, it started a couple of days ago. Mm -hmm. And all that information, I send it out to chiefs and leaders and fisheries, uh, First Nation fisheries biologists. If the, if the federal government wants it, absolutely, you can have it, but they are not my audience anymore. They're not who I'm working for mm -hmm. uh, because I really want these salmon to survive. And these governments have the power and the understanding and the will to do it. Mm -hmm. And why don't they? And why don't what? Why don't they protect the wild salmon? If they have that power and if they have the knowledge, what is, who are the big players that are keeping them in their pocket? Oh, well, the big players in this case are just three companies whose head offices are in Norway. Mm -hmm. but, but if you look at DFO or Fisheries and Oceans Canada, they actually never have protected the fish. Whether it's the, the dam at Mount Polly breaking or it's overfishing uh, that, that wiped out the North Atlantic cod or the way logging is handled. Um, I, I, I'm actually trying to figure out right now, do you try to get inside of DFO and make the changes or do you just abandon that system completely and just go to a First Nations system? Mm -hmm. And I know lots of non-Indigenous people that worries them, but I, I at this moment uh, in history, when we're facing the end of so many things, mm -hmm. why not go with a government that actually wants life? That seems like a really good place to start. Right. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, when we're talking about the way that these laws and governing structures have been built, you know, we it, it's not that old, right? We, on, we only have 200, 500 years in some places to look at how these laws came to be in the, the colonial history and, you know, what interests were being served and protected in any field or any, you know, space that you look at. So it's important to acknowledge that and recognize that, you know, who is being upheld and protected and who is being left out. When I met you, I met you on, like I said, a marine harvest fish farm. Um, and, you know, I was right there with you and I, I, that's where I met Ernest Elfred, who I see is here, a part yeah. of this chat yeah. as well. And, you know, Chief George Quack sister Jr. and a group of, of youth as well, who then later were camping out for quite some time. Can you tell me about that occupation and kind of what came from that occupation? Who was involved? So the salmon farming industry came into the Muskomat Zawadenik Namgis territory in approximately 1987. And for some reason, um, all of those nations never did say yes, never agreed to it being there. Um, I personally thought it was a good idea, <laughs> which was, was wrong. I thought it would help my community of Echo Bay stay alive. And so for the next 30 years, as every farm license and tenure uh, came up and the nations were asked, you know, is it okay? As I understand it, they said no every single time for 30 years. 
And finally, it got to the point where nobody had any salmon coming home. Uh, the, the rivers were just down to a tenth of 1%. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it was a chain of events that really started with Chief George Kwok, sister junior, who had the, the guts to go on these farms in his regalia and stick an underwater camera in the farms. Mm -hmm. And oh my gosh, the things we saw. Mm -hmm. And so I edited together that footage. Uh, we were on a boat gifted to me by um, Paul Watson. He gave it to me with a crew for a period of months. And we picked up George in Campbell River and we started up the coast and George went to every farm, every pen. And he showed that there were herring in those farms, tons of herring. And he showed that the disease and sickness. And so then we went to the villages of the Broughton Archipelago mm -hmm. and showed these videos. And uh, I remember up in, um, Kinkum Village, they asked me to turn it off because they were they were just so upset by the condition of these fish. And um, and that ignited a young hereditary chief named Ernest Alfred, a school teacher. And we were at a meeting and, and everybody's like, what do we do? And you know, meetings like that, people are like, oh, let's just hook onto them and tow them away or let's do this. Ideas that never are gonna happen, right? And Ernest stands up and he goes, well, I don't know what the rest of you are going to do, but I'm going to occupy the Swanson farm till they move. And, and, and it just, it changed everything. And I'm like, okay, I'm with you. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, went out the door and, and two days later, him and um, Carissa Glendale, a young 23 year old First Nations woman from Alert Bay, gone to school with my daughter. Uh, they occupied the farm. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, from there, that was in August, really nice weather. And everybody was still there in December with more people. Uh, Melina Dawson and others occupied a second farm. And uh, they were still there in January, February, March. <laughs> mm -hmm. 280 days later, there were injunctions. But by then, the leadership of these nations had stepped in because in addition to Ernest were all these young indigenous women. Mm -hmm who went and pitched their tents. And mm -hmm. there was an inflatable rainbow unicorn at one of the farms. Mm -hmm. They brought their own youth and feminism to it, but they sat there immovable. I mean, their ancestors must have been so proud. Mm -hmm. And now today, uh, the leadership uh, won the right to start removing those farms. Mm -hmm. And young wild salmon are swimming just through that area. Mm -hmm. They're swimming through that area unharmed. So I just, what an incredible experience for me to, to witness all of that and to remember it. And I thought I, that's what made me write the book was, was the occupation, mm -hmm. the incredible human behavior that sometimes comes of certain events and circumstances. And you mentioned that, you know, a decision, December 2020 decision that farms are going to be uh, phased out in the discovery. And I want to get back to that because there is a question um, in the question in the chat here that says, how did they get away with restocking? So I, I really want to come back because that seems to be the most recent um, yeah. kind of turn of events. And you would probably have the best perspective to explain to us what that means. But before we jump there, for those who might be a little less familiar, and this could seem like the most obvious and probably exhausting question in the world, how are you sure that fish farms negatively impact wild salmon populations? Thank you for that question. Because I look at the fish. And so beginning in 2001, I take my speedboat and I have a 150 foot beach seine net. So I get out of the boat, I tie one end to the shore and I make a big circle, I pull it in. I put the fish in a bucket and I developed a technique of putting each one in a baggie and looking at it with a hand lens and counting the number of lice, quickly measuring it and then letting the fish go. Mm -hmm. So when you start at the river, these fish are beautiful. They're silvery and blue, jet black eyes. They're just tiny when, they're, when they come out of the river. And then you get to the farm and they have sprinkled with lice. And as they keep migrating, the lice get older. And then they get to the next farm and they have more lice. And then there's a place in the Broughton Archipelago that I named the Bay of the Damned. Mm -hmm. Because by the time these little fish got there, they couldn't keep up with the lice mm -hmm. and they're lying on their sides, they're emaciated. They've, they've just given up and the kingfishers are eating them. Mm -hmm. And then I got into virus research. You can't see the viruses, but it's the same story. So these are feedlots 
and parasites and viruses and bacteria get in and they breed in all these fish that aren't migrating. They're Atlantic salmon and <laughs> they're stressed mm -hmm. and they explode out into a blizzard of pathogens. Mm -hmm. And the wild fish going by are opening their mouths and they're breathing this in. It's touching their gills and it's entering their bloodstreams. Mm -hmm. So there is no way to do this industry in the water. It needs to get out into a tank if, if you want to do this. Personally, I believe in wild fish and the power of them and their ability to naturally reproduce, but you're gonna make an artificial unnatural system. You need to take it away from the wild system. Otherwise you cause chaos and death. Mm -hmm. so I'm absolutely certain mm -hmm. these salmon farms are destroying the wild salmon of this coast. And where do these fish go that come from these salmon farms? Do they, is this what people are eating in supermarkets and in sushi mm -hmm. restaurants? Yes, anytime you get a piece of salmon that has white stripes in it, that white is the fat and that's a farm salmon. Mm -hmm. And it's in Costco, it's in all the supermarkets. Sometimes in the, uh, in the sushi restaurants, you order salmon, you get farm salmon. Mm -hmm. You order wild salmon, you get sockeye and it's wild, all sockeye is wild. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it's, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that and now kind of Coming back to that question of most recent events, can you update us? Tell us about that December decision in 2020. Um, you know, we read headlines that salmon farms are going to be phased out in the next years. Um, and then we've also read headlines that that decision itself might come into question. So where are things at right now? So quite remarkable. So after the success of the Broughton Archipelago, other First Nations realized, oh, it is possible to get rid of these farms. But who wants to do a 280 day occupation if they don't have to? So in the Discovery Islands, all of the licenses there were due to expire on the 18th of December. And that triggered consultation with seven First Nations who have overlapping territories in that region. And the, the nations all told the Minister of Fisheries, they just, they wanted these farms out. Mm -hmm. And extraordinarily, I mean, I cannot believe it to this day, the Minister of Fisheries said, okay. And um, she told Sir Mac Maui and Greek, you can finish growing the fish in the pens, but you, you can't put any more in. Well, <laughs> uh, this didn't go down well with these companies uh, because they have fish, the fish that go in the pen, first they're in another pen in another area. And before that they're in the hatchery. It actually takes four years to grow a farm salmon. So the slowest, growing farm salmon and, or a farm animal in the world. Mm -hmm. And so Maui, one of the companies sued the Minister of Fisheries. First Nations wanted to join the lawsuit. The court said no. So it was Maui against the First Nations. They allowed a group of environmental environmentalists and I was part of that to, to join, but we weren't allowed to provide any evidence. The hearing happened and Maui won. But all they won was the right to ask the minister to make the decision again, whether she's um, going to allow them to transfer those fish into the Discovery Islands. Mm -hmm. Now, in addition to seven nations saying no, you have the Fraser River sockeye that are on a steep trajectory to extinction. And by that, I mean, the Shuswap Lake, for example, got 27 sockeye back. This is a river of uh, you know, tens of thousands. Mm -hmm. Other rivers were in the same, other tributaries of the Fraser are the same shape. So you have the biggest wild salmon and run in the world going extinct. This whole thing is happening on the migration route of those fish. Seven nations say, get out. Canada agrees with them. And this company, Maui, thinks it's its position to go to court to reverse this. And so now that's what they've done. They're going, to, they're going to ask the minister again and try to force their fish into the, into the nations, uh, seven nations who said no. But the minister gets to make this choice again. And I hope, you know, this book, um, it's really a choose your own ending because it's not over. And as people read this book, uh, what are you going to do with that knowledge? Mm -hmm. And one thing you can do right now is write to Minister Bernadette Jordan. She's in Nova Scotia and ask her to please say no to restocking those farms because she still has a chance to say no. Mm -hmm. 
because it, it's a slippery slope. Now that Maui's done this once, are they going to do this every single time they're not allowed? Right. So it, yeah, we're, it's a delicate moment. The runs of salmon are so low, they need to get to sea without being covered with sea lice and ingesting all these bacteria and viruses. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you've written a letter or two before. Yes, I have. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed I, that part of the book. Yeah, in the beginning, I thought letter writing was going to be enough. And I started this whole thing because a fisherman came to me and asked me to write a letter. Otherwise, honestly, I wouldn't have noticed this for quite a while. Uh, but the DFO answered me, dear Ms. Morton, you have no evidence. Mm -hmm. And that really kind of, I was like, yeah, no, actually I did give you evidence. Let me give it to you again. And so I, I wrote it again. I tried to be really professional about it and take all the emotion out. Well, I ended up writing 10,000 pages of letters. I had a little mark I made above the uh, printer, which was in my floating house. So I go down and start the generator and turn on, this was before email. <laughs> and start the little printer that would make all these up. And I'd go to the post office with all these letters and our mail got there by seaplane. And the postmistress said, I actually kept the post office open for a couple of years with all my letters. So, I mean, they did some good, but um, yeah, letter writing was not enough. <laughs> Alexander, you have a question here from Graham Gillies. Hi, Graham. Um, he says, my hands up to you. Thank you for all the work you do. Alexandra, I remember being lucky enough to interview you back in 2008, 2009 during the Cohen Commission and the slap suit against Don Stanford. Do you feel like any of the recommendations made have been followed, followed up on and have made a positive impact? Also, how many farms remain and what's the current timeline on their permanent removal? So the Cohen Commission changed my life and I became a virus hunter and that that did have a big impact. But also the whole reason that the Discovery Islands um, farm licenses expired last December was because of the Cohen Commission, which put them on an annual renewal every year while all the other licenses had much longer time. And he really focused on the Discovery Islands, which is why all this is happening now in the Discovery Islands, because he said it looks to us that these farms might have an irre, uh, irreparable impact on the Fraser River sockeye. Mm -hmm. So, so that was um, very big. But thank you for the second part of the question because all of the federal licenses for all the salmon farms expire on the entire coast in June of next year. Mm -hmm. And that means every First Nation will be consulted. And so nobody can sit on the fence. And because of the arguments that I saw Maui use this time, and they also used on the Numgis with the Swanson Island farm, if a nation even thinks they might possibly want to get rid of this industry, it might be an idea to just put the minister on notice right now and the company so that nobody can say, oh, we didn't know, mm -hmm. uh, which is what they're saying now, despite everything that went on, they said the thing we didn't know. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's within our power to get rid of this entire industry and upgrade it to land-based or whatever else people wanna do, but get it out of the water. Mm -hmm. This is the last moment to save wild salmon. And so it's, it's a huge opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it gives me some hope that we might be able to fix this. Mm -hmm. And you know, you and I were chatting a bit before saying how usually what the response is to that or well, what about the jobs? right? Because there right. are First Nations peoples that work on these farms, there are economies here. And what is your answer to that? So the jobs of these people is really the only concern. What happens to these companies is not our concern. What happens to those European shareholders is not our concern. Mm -hmm. But the people who were on these farms working in the industry, they are caught in this and the government should take care of them, provide a safety net, mm -hmm. make sure that they can transition to something else, because this is not their fault. Mm -hmm. Mind you, they should have seen the writing on the wall, but you know how it is. You, you got bills to pay and you just stay in the one thing. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, they are the only concern in, in removing the industry mm -hmm. uh, that, that I think government should be paying attention to. Mm -hmm. Some of these questions are connected here and I'm seeing they're coming up in the chat and the Q&A, but one question from Aliana, for a youth who has no experience writing letters to politicians, what resources do you suggest? Where can I find this information? And then there's a similar question in the chat that says, can you give us a suggested letter format? So it sounds like folks are ready, pens are ready and they, they oh, want wow. to- 
So, okay, well, contact me on Facebook and I will draft up a letter. And then if you would put your personal touch on it, so it doesn't seem like it's just, you know, uh, the same letter over and over But mm -hmm. Yeah, contact me on Facebook, Alexandra Morton. I'll help you with that. Great. And Gail wants a clarification. Thank you. thank you for that question, you guys. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Okay. Um, Gail in the chat is saying, it's my understanding that Norwegian fish farms salmon here because Norway doesn't permit this function. Is that true, Alex? And I know you address this in your book a bit, but. Yeah, so Norway loves the industry, but they are concerned now that all these diseases and sea lice are destroying the industry itself. And so they're not giving out ocean permits anymore. They're trying to move the industry on land. And the only permits they're giving are the ones that uh, will be on land. Mm -hmm. But really interesting, back in 1991, uh, a member of the Norwegian government testified in front of our Senate. And he said, the Norwegian fish farmers said, we want bigger farms and we said no. And they said to us, we will go to Canada. We can do as we like. Mm -hmm. And this man was warning our government. And he said, this is a very hot subject, I think. So, so there was something really off about this whole thing at the very beginning. Well, myself and the nations were naive. Even the First Nations that got contracts with this industry, nobody told them, we're going to wipe your fish out. Right. We're, we're going to make it okay for you, but we're going to wipe your fish out. Everyone was told, this will be good for you. Mm -hmm. But our government knew that there were serious problems. So mm -hmm. this is the only part of the story and it doesn't really matter at this point, but I am curious, how did this whole thing start? How did they get this much power? And really, who are these guys? Right, yeah. I would like to know. Well, you went to Norway, didn't you? I went to Norway and um, I spoke at the annual general meetings and I went with um, Chief Robert Chamberlain mm -hmm. and uh, oh, he was amazing. He got up at this, uh, the, at this AGM and there's all these super wealthy Europeans. Like the woman sitting next to me was like in a leopard bodysuit with blue suede shoe <laughs> cowboy boots. As you do. <laughs> <laughs> I remembered that. But he went up to the CEO of Marine Harvest, who was a woman at the time, Os Michelet, and he presented her with a pair of silver wolf earrings. Mm. And she thought she was getting a gift. But all the First Nations on here will know he was paying her to listen. Mm -hmm. And he said, you're going to have to get out of our territory. And they laughed. But they're leaving now. Mm -hmm. So um, Bob Chamberlain's a big part of this book as well, uh, because he is chase this thing for decades. That's right. Um, Lori Watt joined late and she says the CPP investment board is a major shareholder of Maui. Is there anything we can do about that? Oh, this is amazing. So yeah, Canadian pension plan is, plan is like the eighth biggest investor in, in Maui. Mm -hmm. And this is another group to write to and just say, this, this is not a good investment. <laughs> I mean, just everything else aside, this is not a good investment. This industry is in trouble around the world um, and particularly here. So mm -hmm. I don't really know who the head of the Canadian pension plan is, but they should be divesting from this company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, comment says that's disgusting. Our pension plan supports fish farms. Um, just shifting the conversation a little bit, unless we have more questions coming in, I wanna talk a little bit about the book. Can you tell us how the book is doing so far? When was it actually released and how is it doing? And then I'm, I'm a little bit nosy about the process of writing it. So it was released on May 23rd. And the first week it was number three uh, nonfiction bestseller in Canada. I just, my son just sent me a little message. It's the number one on amazon.ca for the earth scientists, sciences. Did you say May 23rd or March 23rd? Thank you, <laughs> March 23rd. And um, it, uh, I, I, boy, I did not expect that. But now that it is doing well, I realize that the better it does, the more government will have to listen because a lot of what I detail in there is the subversion of science that is going on inside DFO. There's a whole level of Fisheries and Oceans Canada that has worked very hard to suppress any information about this industry being bad mm -hmm. and they really need to be called out mm -hmm. because they need to exit stage left 
just go work straight for the companies or go to early retirement, whatever. Mm-hmm. And there needs to be new people put into positions of, of authority in DFO. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What was this writing process like for you? When did you know that you were going to turn all of this into a book? And, and where were you when you were writing it? I picture you in a quiet room with the sound of the ocean kind of lapping on the shore and just traveling back through time, you know, to some of what sound like the most in the book, you know, at least reading it, some of the most traumatic and moving and inspiring and quietest moments. And you paint those pictures so vividly for the reader, uh, which I really appreciate because it's a deep and dirty issue and you're able to humanize it in the way that you write it, the way that you talk about your your children sleeping while you're out there throwing nets, the way that you talk about your internal reflections on what this impact has been like for your family and the way that you've been impacted, you know, as a young woman, as a woman just following, you know, these whales. So thank you again for taking the time to transform all of that into something that we can, we can share and be a part of. But what was that writing process like for you? Well, I I had the niggling thought that I had to write this all down because the story was just so unbelievable that no one really believed it. Nobody believed me. Um, And people were just getting snippets of it. It, But writing to me felt like holding a painful yoga pose. I could just like, oh, just do it a little while and then step away. But my sister loves writing. And I happened to see her uh, at Christmas of 2018. And I said, okay, tell me about loving to write. What does that feel like? Well, I believe my big sister and I was able to internalize that. And so I came back and I began writing and I, be, I wrote like 12 and 14 hour days. Um, my eyes were begging to look at something other than a screen. Um, and I keep these journals. I have these really small notebooks, which are so, they, they're not intimidating to fill one of those little pages out every day. Mm-hmm. And I was so thankful I did that because Honestly, I'd blocked a lot of it out and I would be reading through it and, and I'd be like, no, there's no way you did that the next day. Oh my God, woman, no wonder you're tired. It was <laughs> very cathartic to write it all down. Um, but I'll tell you on the third edit, and I had a really good editor, Ann Collins, um, I just broke down in tears. I was just like, this, this story is too sad, <laughs> you know, because it's just lose, lose, get beat up, lose, lose, lose. Um, and fortunately, I was able to end it, you know, on a more positive note. But it felt really good to get the story down because when you're a person, never mind a biologist, but when you're a person and you're watching the world around you be destroyed, and you know the starvation that is going to cause and the pain, Mm -hmm. and you know what children are gonna think. (laughs) They're gonna go, you know, you, how did you let this happen? Mm -hmm. It eats at you. And so getting it out was really good. And now that I see that people are actually reading it. And, you know, I've, I've suggested to my friends, send it to your member of parliament and tell them to read it. Mm-hmm. because they will realize this is a scandal that is way too dirty to be associated with. Mm-hmm. And I, I put citations, everything I say, because I know there's people that are going to want to sue me for this book, mm-hmm. but I put the citations in the end so that people can see where that information came from. Cause I've been in court so many times with this industry and they always say, you know, what was that based on? Okay. There it is. Right. Right. You did your homework. You've learned. <laughs> I've learned. Yeah. One of the first questions here was from Douglas asking about actually your experience running for the Green Party. And and it might be a question that's on other folks' mind as well. Um, Their question exactly is, what was your highlight and largest lesson when you ran for the Green Party in the last provincial election? Uh, Well, the biggest lesson was um, how amazingly intelligent people are. Mm -hmm. So when you're running for office, uh, they kind of they know what you're doing um, and they'll talk to you. So I talked to nurses and doctors and to construction workers and loggers. And um, I didn't talk to fish farmers, but I would have liked to. Um, and this sheer breadth of knowledge. I mean, people know what they need. Uh, it was, it, I just kept thinking, 
you know, why aren't we doing that? Like in talking about the forestry industry, they're like, yeah, there's just too many layers. We got that corporate layer. We don't really need it. We need the government, the contractors, the workers, the forest. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's like, yeah, that, <laughs> that makes sense rather than siphoning all the money off into some kind of, you know, no go zone. Mm -hmm. But I also learned about the steel workers union because they were very angry that I was running and they represent the fish farm workers. And, and, and I was like, oh, that's why John Horgan is so hesitant now to say anything about fish farms. That's gotta be the steel workers union. So mm -hmm. I learned a lot. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna do it again, but I did learn a lot. It was a fabulous experience. Thanks for sharing that. Um, an anonymous attendee asks, Alex, in your recent newsletter, you mentioned that Maui is litigating against the Canadian government, but that they recently received fact tap F-A-C-T-A-P funding. Oh. Do you think that funding is to appease the company due to the impact of the D Discovery Island decision? Um, so yeah, this was at the end of the newsletter, which I also saw that you said 305,000, no, 305,169 for Maui, Canada, west of Campbell River to support their installation of an emissions-free solar power system at the, what are your thoughts on that? Can you explain a little bit? Yeah, that makes me think the government is really afraid of Maui. And CERMAC also got $750,000. So here you have a company, you've told them they can't put fish back. Uh, Prime Minister Trudeau has said the whole industry has to get out of the water by 2025. Mm -hmm. And you give $300,000 to, to make more Atlantic salmon. Maui wins a lawsuit on Monday. And on Wednesday, you give them $300,000. Mm -hmm. I don't really think that's... There are so many groups out there fighting to keep wild salmon alive, trying to put eelgrass back in the ocean, trying to help the herring spawn on pilings. Mm -hmm. And you gave $300,000 to Maui to make more Atlantic salmon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's something really off about that. Well, and so you've filed a lot of access to information requests, which as a journalist, I respect. <laughs> I, I love that you just get right into it, but I'm sure that there are still documents that your eyes did not see even the ones that you saw were telling and you share a lot of what you found in your book. Did you ever sense that there were things that were still being kept from you that were still behind the scenes? Oh yeah, there's this thing called redaction. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what I get, there's black lines through it mm -hmm. or there's entire pages missing, uh, particularly when they're talking about this virus PRV, which industry and some people in government say is local and benign mm -hmm. but other people say it's from Norway and it causes the red blood cells in Chinook salmon to explode mm -hmm. well a lot of that information is missing and I also did an ATIP uh, oh, about a year ago for all the correspondence between Norway and mm -hmm. Canada mm -hmm. and the, the office got back to me and they're like yeah that's there's so much there that's going to take a couple of years I said okay I'll wait yeah right yeah so I'm still waiting. I should actually check what the due date on that is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's That could be a whole book in itself, hey? I'm very curious how this got started um, because the answer, we have the answer. So in DFO is this remarkable scientist who can read the immune system of salmon. Mm -hmm. And that allows the fish to talk to us mm -hmm. again. First Nations will tell you that they were talking to us, mm -hmm. but we lost that. And if you, but if you read their immune system and you sample them as they come down the Fraser River and then out into the ocean, you can see where the immune system lights up and says, oh, I'm in water that's too warm or I'm starving or I'm having a virus problem. Um, and then you can go to that area and you can change our behavior. And then when the fish go through there again, you can ask the fish, did we make it better for you? And so we have this ability to fix it. But if you can believe it, DFO has over has tens of thousands of employees, but there is nobody in charge of wild salmon. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's what <laughs> we, we need somebody in there who's in charge of wild salmon, who has a department, has money. That person I believe should be First Nations mm -hmm. because <laughs> they're the governments that understand that we need this fish. Mm -hmm. And in any case, connect with all the First Nations mm -hmm and look at the whole pattern of what is going on. Where are, the, where are the rivers dying? Where are they coming back? Read their immune systems, find out what they're suffering from. Ask the fish again and again, where's your problem? Where's your problem? 
start fixing those problems. And in the process, we are going to learn what we have done wrong to our environment. The same way to become our teachers. Mm -hmm. And it's so frustrating that this science exists in DFO. But if you must, if you Google muzzled scientist DFO, mm -hmm. this woman's name will come up, Christy Miller. Mm -hmm. And she is the one leading the science. Mm -hmm. And um, the people who are supporting aquaculture and DFO are just so incredibly industrious about suppressing her work. Uh, I mean, currently they're suppressing information about a disease called mouth rot that is in most of these farms that mm -hmm. is pouring out and killing sockeye and Chinook and coho. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it's a big fight, but mm -hmm. hopefully a lot of you will weigh in and all the Minister of Fishery needs to know is more people want wild salmon than farm salmon. Mm -hmm. The government in the end just wants to be on the big team. <laughs> they just want to know that they have our support in this because the fish farmers are talking to them. Mm -hmm. We're not quite as good at talking to government. Mm -hmm. Certainly fishermen aren't. They're too wild and, you know, too busy fighting with each other and fishing. Mm -hmm. So we as the individuals need to pick up this voice and just make sure they know and hold their feet to the fire. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope that this book does find as many hands and eyes and hearts as possible because it, you know, it really does take the issue and it makes it relatable. Like even when I met you, you know, we had great conversations right off the bat and in the article that was provided, and I apologize for my early writing, I looking back, I kind of, you know, you roll your eyes at some of the things that you thought was good writing at the time, but, you know, you shared about how people need to understand that there are pre-existing you know, functioning indigenous governing systems um, and that they can be a part of that, that they can abide by those laws as well. They can respect those laws. There's place for people to engage and to listen and to learn. And you talked about your, your granddaughter, um, you know, and, and worrying about her future. And, and that's why you were there doing what you were doing. And, and so it's just so nice to hear all of that as a part of the book and hear what it, you know, what it takes to really kind of commit ourselves and to get outside of our comfort zones. Cause I think some people feel like, well, what does any of that have to do with me? You know, it doesn't have anything to do with me. And we, we have another question in the chat that says, well, how else can we get involved with the cause? So once we've written to the minister, once we've written to our MLAs, once we, we've written the letters, what else can we do to protect and stand with the wild salmon? Well, you can go to your sushi restaurant in your market and say, please don't sell this. You're destroying this coast. Mm -hmm. um, you can reach out to the other. There's, there are other groups. There's uh, Living Oceans and Watershed Watch who are working very hard on this. But if you are in a territory of a First Nation with fish farms, um, I mean, it's difficult to work with First Nation governments. Really, in my opinion, what, what needs to be done, the only thing you can do is say, I'm here and I, I could do this if you need me and then just wait mm -hmm. um, because there needs to be support. For example, I pay symbolic taxes to the Namgis every year because I am so grateful for mm -hmm. the enormous effort they're going to to keep the world that I am living in alive. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, don't be afraid of activism. You know, if there is a call out go mm -hmm. or send someone. I know maybe we can't do that right now in COVID, but a, a form of activism right now is, is to buy this book. And I know I sound mercenary to say this, mm -hmm. but buy the book and make sure your member of parliament and your MLA reads it mm -hmm. or give it to your library mm -hmm. or send it to a chef who refuses to believe you that farm salmon is bad mm -hmm. because the whole story is there. You know, and as I say to people, if you had seen what I have seen and others, many of them are on this chat, I see, mm -hmm. you would, you'd be in the same shoes. You would be fighting to keep these salmon. So the book tells the story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice to hear from Ernest Alfred and, you know, to think back and about the, the relationships and the experiences that we have that really drive us deeper into the work that we commit our, you know, this life on this earth doing, right? And I'm wondering, you're now this many years into this fight, you know, a visitor, learning your place, sharing this book, sharing your story. 
what are some big lessons that you can share with, let's say, environmentalist activists that are trying to get into the work and trying to do it in a good way? If you could look back and if you could have done things differently, are there things that you would have done right out the gate? Absolutely. I mean, the whole concept that I could do this myself was just so wrong. I had no idea how big a thing this was. And so you have to do everything you can to make allies, but then also benefit your allies. And if you get hurt by your allies, do not storm off. If they are good intentioned, just keep running. You know, I keep, I think of us like a herd of wild horses. I don't know if you've seen a herd of wild horses running, but they're nipping at each other and kicking and, and colliding, but they're all running in the same direction. And, and for the environmental groups, you know, try, introduce yourself to First Nations. Mm -hmm. And FYI, never say you should do anything because nobody wants to hear that. Mm -hmm. It has to be always the offering mm -hmm. and waiting, mm -hmm. offer and wait, uh, because it's a difficult path. No, we haven't, nobody's forged this road. Nobody really knows what reconciliation looks like. It's all experimental, but it's us who are in it. And we're in a planet that absolutely requires this. Mm -hmm. We have these incredibly powerful governments that can make the change. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I never thought I would be involved in indigenous rights at all. It never crossed my mind. And now I know it is absolutely key. Well, Nothing inseparable too, isn't it? Work. What? And it's inseparable too. I mean, yeah. if you want to talk about whales, you know, even at that time when you first thought, okay, you saw Jane Goodall, like you share in your book and you said, I'm going to do that too. I'm going to dedicate my life and my work to working with whales. It's inseparable from indigenous rights as well, right? The health and vitality of ecosystems, as we know, are connected to the health and vitality of indigenous cultures and laws all around the world, um, you know, and that's been proven. Um, so, yes. Yeah, I think I think it's really important to to share that and to voice that. And as a journalist, you know, somebody who gets to just listen and witness and then be a vessel for these stories. I'm I've been hearing over the last few years a lot of exciting things about tribal parks programs, indigenous yeah. guardians, indigenous led conservation initiatives. Um, you know, there's a tourist tax that could potentially go towards the Cleoquiet Nation, where Tofino is a hot spot for tourism in Canada. And of course, there are businesses and sports fishermen and folks that are against that. But there are ways, you know, to maintain and engage with these economies that support nations and support the stewards of the land and waters and territories that we get to live and coexist on. And the people like as you know, you might remember George saying with the know how. <laughs> The people with the know-how <laughs> and it's yeah. a really simple yeah. way of saying something that's much deeper but um as our conversation kind of comes to a close and i do welcome any kind of last questions i'll probably take one more question after um i just wanted to again acknowledge that we're having this conversation about wild salmon and that indigenous peoples and the peoples who have had relationships with the wild salmon populations and are inextricably connected to them have been having these conversations for a long, long time. And so we're grateful to be in this work with you. And we thank you for everyone for being a part of this tonight. Um, the last question that I'll ask you, Alexandra, and then I'll give you a moment to share any last thoughts is, there is an Aboriginal Aquaculture Association who are advocating for industry. Did your FOI request reveal anything about that relationship? And is there a way out for nations dependent on salmon farm op operations? I, I didn't look at that in my ATIF. I didn't make that a subject and I didn't come across it. Um, but, but yes, for all nations, June of next year, all of the fish farm federal licenses are going to expire and your nation will be asked to uh, agree to the renewal of those licenses or not. And so there'll be no fence sitting. It's, it, it, everybody's gonna have to make the choice. Um, but, but in closing, for the people, I, I was on an interview a couple days ago from people in Ontario and they're like, why do we need salmon? And people on this coast say the same thing. And if you're breathing, you need salmon because the salmon go out in the ocean and they collect the energy of the sunlight hitting that ocean. And then they store it in their flesh because they're feeding on the zooplankton and the small fish. 
and then they carry it up into the mountains. And after they've spawned, they die and all these nutrients pour down over the watersheds and the trees grow that make oxygen and pull that carbon out of the atmosphere. So restoring salmon is fighting climate change. It's producing oxygen, it's producing food. I mean, they really are sacred. They are, um, they are such a successful creature that if we could just allow them to be our teachers, I think that so many things will resolve. Our relationship with First Nations, our relationship with our planet, what we throw in the water, what we teach our children. They really are the, our teachers. And I'm just so honored to have spent time with them and to get to know them. Um, and I hope that I've had a good effect on them. I hope that all the work so many of us done, I saw Julia was on here. She occupied one of the farms <laughs> or several farms. Um, I hope that all the work we have done will pass these fish on to the next generations of whales and trees and humans. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. With that said, we'll turn it over to Jorge for his last thoughts, but thank you so much. It's good to see you and I hope to see you again yeah. soon. Yeah. We can all gather again soon. I and know, I can't wait. This time of alcohol gel and masks and distancing also is another imperative to buy the book and <laughs> connect some of the pieces to what's going on here with the climate. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, both Emily and Alexandra. What a fantastic conversation. And thank you also for, you, um, yeah. for really turning this into a dialogue and for really answering uh, all the audience's questions. So I'm going to ask both Alexandra and Emily to leave now. So thank you so much. It's been wonderful. Thank you for, for being here. Um, so thanks again to my colleague, Candy, who's in the background helping this run smoothly. And I know a lot of you who were watching at home were really wondering what to do about this and how do you get more information out to people? Um, so I have some good news for you. This conversation was being live streamed to Facebook right now. Uh, and so what, what this means is that you'll be able to share it immediately with your friends, like right this second. So we're going to put the, the link to the, uh, the Facebook event, sorry, the Facebook video. And so you can feel free to share it as soon as right now. Um, it's available. It will be available on the VPL website, uh, sorry, Facebook page, whenever you want to access it. So look, look for it there. Now, the other part of sharing information is obviously Alexandra's book. And so the, what I told you at the beginning of the event, but for those of you who joined late, uh, our friends from Massey Books, which is a beautiful bookstore in Chinatown, have 20 signed copies for anyone who attended this event. So you can either go visit them in Chinatown and get your copy there. But I know that some of you are joining us from outside Vancouver or simply you feel uncomfortable about going to a store during a pandemic. So in that case, Massey told me that you can order the book online. And so to make sure you get a signed copy, when you go through the checkout process, in the checkout notes, just indicate that you were part of this event with VPL. And if there's still uh, signed copies available, they'll try to send you a signed copy. So we're gonna put a link to the Massey Books uh, store right there. Um, and the other thing is, we really value your feedback about events like this. We're a public institution and our job is to program things that work for you. So your feedback is really important in helping me shape what I put on stage for you. So uh, we're gonna share a link to a form in the chat, which should help us uh, gather your information. It'll take you like two minutes to fill out this survey. So please take a second, fill out the survey. I promise you it will not end in some black hole of the internet. I sit with my team every single week. We look at your replies, we look at the surveys, we read through them, and then we adapt our programming based on that. Um, so on that note, speaking of programs, I'm gonna end by telling you about two upcoming events and then I'm gonna wrap it up. So tomorrow, Friday, April 9th, uh, at lunchtime, we have an event with Kung Jade, who's VPL's indigenous storyteller in residence. And that's gonna be a conversation about cedar bark weaving with Haida Guiver Todd DeVries, but also with Kui Jones, who is the guest curator of the Haida Now exhibition that is now on view at the Museum of Vancouver. So they're gonna be talking about this tradition of weaving uh, in the Haida Nation. That's gonna be at noon tomorrow. Um, you can find out about that on the chat. We're, we're putting a link there. And then next Friday on April 16th, um, it's a week before the Oscars. 
And so we're gonna host an event called Black Oscars about what the Academy Awards tell us about race. And so that event's gonna be with Elamine Abdelmahmoud, who is a very well-known CBC podcast host and a pop culture writer for BuzzFeed and a professor from Texas Christian University called Frederick Gooding Jr. who wrote a book analyzing the history of the Oscars and what nominations and winners say about, um, about race. And so that's gonna be next Friday. That's all I got for you tonight. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm gonna do the awkward wave and disappear slowly, but uh, we're gonna let this event run for a few minutes just so that you can go through the chat, click on all the links, connect with each other. So it'll be up for another five minutes. So it won't disappear. I'm gonna disappear. Thank you all for coming and hope to see you some tomorrow. Bye. <laughs>